welcome to a new episode of At War, the podcast by the Conflict Law Center. Today, we are very happy to be joined by Douglas Guilfoyle, who is a professor of law at the University of New South Wales. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So I wanted to talk to you about the International Criminal Court and the rumors which have been swirling for a while now that we're going to have arrest warrants by this court against Israel, Israeli and Hamas leaders. And Israeli leaders have also reacted with quite a bit of anger to the prospect of their issuing. Do you think we're going to see any soon? And do we have any insight into what the ICC is doing? Yes, I mean, it's certainly um, an interesting collection of, of issues. So it seems that the rumors have originated within Israeli government or intelligence circles, and it's hard to know at one level what to make of them. So um, there are a range of possibilities because we are in the field of rumour. So at one level, it might be that there's been some indication that the prosecutor is about to seek uh, arrest warrants, which would involve him making an application to a pre-trial chamber, and that in light of that, Prime Minister Netanyahu has been seeking to mobilise international support. Um, it's also possible, kind of at the other end of the spectrum, that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is looking to some extent for external enemies to shore up his domestic and international support. And the timing of the April Iranian consulate airstrike in Damascus might also fall into that right. category because a lot of observers said, well, why would you, you know, open a conflict potentially on a second front? And part of it may be about uh, reminding both domestic constituents and US allies that, you know, uh, we, or this would be the Israeli perception, that we face these uh, hostile external actors. As for what's happening at the ICC, again, we're, we're dealing to some extent um, with rumour and speculation, but there have been reports in international newspapers like Le Monde and elsewhere that there's been some effort to make diplomatic representations to the ICC. And at first, this was all done under the language of um, you know, G7 diplomats uh, have uh, had meetings with senior officials or made representations to senior officials at the court. And for me, my sort of question was, well, what <laughs> what, what would be a senior official in that yeah. context? The judges are presumably not going to take phone calls from diplomats. And it appears that um, those representations may have been made to the prosecutor on the basis that, you know, if... Uh, you seek arrest warrants too early, it could endanger, for example, um, the ceasefire negotiations. Uh, we also know that on the 24th of April, 12 US senators um, sent a letter to uh, ICC prosecutor Krim Khan threatening him and the court with repercussions if arrest warrants were issued against Israeli officials. And that letter uh, rather uh, ominously ended with the words, you have been warned. Okay. Now, Khan in subsequent statements has said, you know, he's not going to be swayed by external pressure uh, and that he's a servant of the law whose job is to stand up for victims. So uh, it's difficult to know what to make of all that, because really the critical issue is timing. Um, the prosecutor is, in a sense, the engine room of the court because it's his decisions that will trigger other steps. But um, he doesn't have kind of complete discretion over the process. Right, he isn't the one who issues arrest warrants. It would be the pre-trial chamber, uh, and uh, it's also conceivable that arrest warrants have already been issued under seal following a closed proceeding, and we don't know yet. So we know that there are a number of outstanding sealed warrants, uh, as it were, ready for activation in respect of situations such as Libya. Okay. Um, so we don't necessarily have a great deal of insight into precisely what's going on, other than these stories of. Uh, some attempts to exert, in some cases, quite naked political pressure on mm -hmm. the court, and Khan, for his part, saying, uh, to some extent, acknowledging this is happening, but saying that it won't impact his decision making. And these diplomatic representations, you're allowed to make them as a state to the prosecutor? There, well, there's. I think it's one of those things where there's uh, nothing that... There's nothing in the ICC statute that prevents it, right. for example. Uh, and the prosecutor is an international civil servant who engages with governments all the time about the court's work, if you know, potentially seeking cooperation or in an educative capacity. Uh, and he reports to the Security Council. So, I mean, there are 
plenty of channels um, where that kind of engagement might happen. Right. Whether it's completely in the spirit of uh, an entirely independent prosecutor is um, a separate question. Uh, and I've certainly seen some uh, commentators say that they think, you know, it's uh, contrary to international law to try and pressure the prosecutor in this way. I mean, I think if it rises to the level of an attempt to change the administration of justice, and the US Senator's letter might fall into that category, then it could constitute an administration of justice offence under the statute itself. Uh, but the only people who've ever been prosecuted under that provision um, were a series of journalists in the um, situation in Kenya proceedings. So certainly on that particular point, um, you could say that uh, those US senators um, could theoretically face um, administration of justice proceedings at the court, but there'd be an awful lot of steps between that and anything of consequence happening. Okay. We, we've we been very critical of the new prosecutor ever since he came into office and deprioritized uh, the crimes of the Americans in Afghanistan. And uh, the, the only thing that has made me rethink that a little bit, I think um, Kevin John Heller has written a number of articles kind of defending, defending him and especially defending right. him when it comes to Palestine. Um, now, the ICC has really been criticized for dragging its feet on Palestine in contrast to the active role that is taken in the Russia-Ukraine war. And, and I think Kevin John Heller makes a good point, which is like, it's about money. You gave money to that and you're not giving it, nothing to, to the same level was really dedicated to this. Uh, but also in contrast to the ICJ, which is hearing three cases now relating to the conflict since October 7th. Um, and today and tomorrow, we're going to hear more provisional orders, more public hearings in South Africa versus Israel. Do you think that these critiques of the International Criminal Court are fair? Right. Um, so, look, I think there's a lot that the court can be criticised for, and a lot of my publications have been quite critical of the court. So, I mean, I'm I'm on record as saying uh, it has some um, significant institutional problems, and I'm not sure they've yet been addressed, but I'm not sure this is one of those categories. So even on the, the comparison with Ukraine, um, I just don't think the, the heel dragging um, criticism stands up that much because sort of, you know, my understanding is that from the beginning of Khan prioritizing that investigation to the arrest warrants for Vladimir Putin and um, uh, Maria uh, Alexeyevna Lvova Belova was about a year. We're not yet a year from seven yeah. October. So even if we're trying for an, an apples to apples comparison, um, we're not there yet. Uh, and obviously, you can stand up a case at the ICJ much faster than you can stand up a criminal investigation, right? You know, if you can get your uh, governmental legal team, then usually some external counsel based. Uh, in the US or London or Europe, uh, you know, you can have a case on foot in a matter of months. So, you know, we saw uh, yeah. the South African case, uh, you know, launched in December and then, um, you know, provisional measures issued in January. So, I mean, that's really fast, but provisional, protective provisional measures are meant to be. So, again, it's not really an apples to apples comparison. Okay, yeah, fair enough. I, I also think it, it's something to, um, it, it's quite hard to explain what happened in Russia, Ukraine, and yet the crime that uh, Putin is charged with is the crime of deporting children right. out of occupied territory. And I think, and what do you think in terms of what we're looking at for arrest warrants and the crimes charged here, do you agree that they're going to be about starvation and hostage taking? Look, to me, uh, and again, I'm on, I'm on record as saying, to my mind, those are the um, obvious crimes to charge. And going back to the, the Russian situation, yes, I mean, you know, you're faced with uh, an aggression, an act of aggression, appalling war crimes and crimes against humanity happening. Why is the first ICC case about the deportation of children, which is obviously awful, yeah. but, you know, is is only one part of a much bigger picture. And the justification for that in my mind and in the mind of most commentators was, you know, this is uh, not necessarily um, a kind of slam dunk open shut case, but it is 
significantly easier to prove than crimes based on, say, excessive uh, damage to um, civilian objects in the course of armed conflict. As you know, as you and uh, hopefully some of your your listeners will be, you know, aware, those questions about proportionality in armed conflict become very rapidly become very technical. It can be difficult to explain to a layperson, well, why, you know, why isn't this widespread destruction we're seeing just obviously a crime? And it becomes something where you have to parse each strike and each event very carefully. But when you have Putin and his um, Commissioner of Children's Affairs on television saying, we are doing this, we're doing it actively, we're going to look at re-educating these children so they become good Russians, like, you know, you're, you've virtually got a recorded confession to the offence. Right. Um, and that right. makes it much easier to lay out those elements of the crime um, than it would if you started with some of the more complex war crimes. So similarly, there are um, any number of uh, potential crimes that could arise from the facts of this conflict on both sides, particularly you know, things like deliberate attack uh, of civilians, um, again, the question of disproportionate civilian damage, uh, and so on. But those can have complex technical questions, whereas hostage taking on the Hamas side is open shut, right? It's, yeah. you know, yeah. You don't. You can't take hostages in an armed conflict. It's prohibited in all circumstances. They've acknowledged that they've taken the hostages, and the yeah. Hamas leadership plainly have control over when they're released. So you know, even if somehow it wasn't the original plan, they've adopted the conduct. Yes. Um, conversely, yeah. when you have uh, a situation um, where the amount of aid that gets into Gaza is controlled by Israel, uh, where you have numerous UN agencies reporting that uh, the criteria for things being admitted can be arbitrarily changed, that they think they're encountering excessive delay, uh, when you have no effective action being taken against um, Israeli protesters who are you know, on occasion deliberately delaying or attacking the aid trucks, when you have uh, a plethora of UN agencies saying that um, the situation is brinking on famine. And then you have at least two government ministers on record saying that there should be a situation where until the hostages are released, there is no food, water or electricity entering Gaza. Um, you know, on its face, I'm not saying it would necessarily be an easy case to prove beyond reasonable doubt, but it seems to me you've got all the indicia there, that there is yeah. a case worth looking at. So I'd agree that those are probably the uh, most likely um, offences to be charged. And from reports in the Israeli media, they appear to be the ones that the Israeli government, or sorry, the starvation issue appears to be one that um, particularly occupies uh, the minds of Israeli officials at the moment. Oh, okay. Just on... Um... I think both of those crimes, the hostage taking, I think it's interesting how it's taken on a bit of a life of its own in the mainstream discourse about how these are hostages that Hamas has taken, but these political prisoners are also hostages. And I'm like, no, the offense is really not the same. That might be wrong in right. a different way, but it's definitely not hostage taking. Um, right. And also the the issue of starvation, I, I would find it interesting to see going forward if that is the main crux of South Africa's argument at the ICJ, how much would the ICJ be looking at the ICC in terms of corroborating the, that as an offence? Well, I mean, I think the, the, the difficulties that South Africa faces at the ICJ are um, in some ways of a different order because presumably the crux of their case, if... Um, in bringing a case under the Genocide Convention is going to be to say, well, we think there's a um, manifest and systematic pattern of conduct that evinces genocidal intent. And the difficulty with genocide is always, obviously, that it's not just that uh, a lot of people have died or suffered uh, or been exposed to um, conditions likely to bring about their destruction. It's that it obviously has to be done with the intent to destroy yeah. a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group in whole or in part. Um, and, uh, you know, it is now very uncommon, uh, almost unthinkable that a government would document in terms that that's 
policy. So you almost always have to infer it. And the ICJ has said in its case law that it will only conclude that there is genocidal intent based on that sort of inference if it is the only conclusion that the inferences point to. So, I mean, I'm not suggesting Israel would do this, but, but you know, ironically, one could even imagine a situation where you say, well, certainly all of these very bad things have happened and they might even constitute war crimes, but they weren't done with genocidal intent. And you could yeah. defeat the case in that way, as it were, confess to a different crime that's not in the jurisdiction of the court yeah. and, and thus take the issue off the table. Or even say, well, if bad things have happened, it's rogue units. There's no state policy mm. here. Um, whereas I think probably the, the easiest thing uh, to, uh, for the easiest win I could see um, South Africa having would be on the issue of incitement to genocide. Right, because yeah. you, you have had some incredibly heated and intemperate statements being made um, by, uh, you know, members of the Nesset or even members of the cabinet. Uh, and it was interesting that shortly after the first um, provisional measures uh, orders were given by the ICJ, there was a statement from, I think it was the Attorney General's department in Israel, as it were, kind of reminding everyone, hey, incitement to genocide is an offence under Israeli law. Right. And, you know, you shouldn't. Uh, engage in it. So, uh, you know, if, if in that case I was to say, well, what would be, you know, regardless of uh, where one might think the ultimate rights and wrongs of the situation are, what would be the easiest thing to prove in that particular forum? Mm -hmm. uh, I strongly suspect it would be uh, incitement to genocide. Oh, okay. Yeah. And in terms of how you think they're going to do on the merits of the case by then? Um, I Look, yeah, uh, I'm. I'm not. No. Uh, I'm not in the business of trying to predict okay. outcomes. I, I just sort of go. I just go back to my my sort of basic statement that the difficulty you've got before the ICJ is that very uniquely high yeah. evidentiary threshold, um, which you know again, uh, you know, listeners who've done a course in kind of public international law or international criminal law might might remember that you know out of all the events in Bosnia the ICJ was only prepared to call yeah. events at Srebrenica a genocide because its test was so narrow and exacting. So then moving on to the question of immunity, uh, when it came to al-Bashir and Putin, it was a very, very contested one, and countries that both these leaders traveled to were under a fair amount of pressure to arrest them. So how would the question, if we see arrest warrants being issued against um, Benjamin Netanyahu and other members, top members of his cabinet, how would it, they apply to them in the event of an arrest warrant being issued? And what do you think European right. states are likely to do? Right. So that's a great question. And it, there's obviously a fair bit to unpack. Um, so the, the sort of first, where I always sort of start this discussion is, you know, well, let's look at the ICC statute, right? The ICC statute is a treaty. And so first and foremost, it binds its member states. So one possible consequence of that is if an arrest warrant is issued for someone, uh, they should be surrendered to the court. But as you've said, um, you know, there are personal immunities that attach to the head of state, the head of government, and uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs at a minimum out of um, senior governmental officials. So the question is, you know, if a suspect uh, is not from a state that's party to the statute, can they plead their immunity, the immunity they would normally have from foreign criminal jurisdiction uh, against an ICC arrest warrant? And if we look at the ICC statute itself, on the one hand, Article 27 says in proceedings before the court in an actual trial, official capacity is irrelevant. So that's taken as removing those immunities. But Article 98 of the ICC statute talks about essentially, I'm oversimplifying, but respecting immunities when they're invoked in arrest and surrender proceedings by states that are not parties to the statute. So you have... You know, how I always read that uh, as a student and when first teaching international criminal law was to say, well, this sets up a sort of two-step system. If you're before the court, you cannot plead immunity. Right. But on your way to the court, mm -hmm. you might be able to plead immunity if you're not a state party. Now, the Bashir situation 
uh, obviously had its origins in a Security Council referral to the court. Um, so the question then was, well, is President Bashir, well, he's no longer president, but at the time, President Bashir, entitled to head of state immunity? And, you know, a number of uh, African, uh, at least executive governments, if not always the judicial arm of government, said, well, we should respect his immunity. How are we going to conduct a peace process if we don't? And when that issue went to the um, appeals chamber in the ICC, they could have said, well, this situation is special because of the Security Council referral. Mm -hmm. The Security Council referral puts Sudan in the same place as any ordinary state party and just resolved um, the immunities issue in that way, which I think would have been relatively uncontroversial. Uh, but instead, as you know, what they said was, no, international criminal law and customary international law has moved on. You may never claim immunity in respect of uh, international criminal proceedings, um, not only in a substantive trial, but even in procedures for arrest and surrender. Uh, and therefore, there are no immunities to respect. Um, now, I thought that uh, decision was um, contestable, uh, and certainly it has the very odd effect of kind of vacating most of Article 98 of any meaning. And normally when we interpret treaties, we kind of say, well, you can't come up with an interpretation that means uh, something that the treaty drafters deliberately put in no longer has a useful job to do. Mm -hmm. uh, nonetheless, that's what the court uh, said. And so that is, as it were, internal to the court, the law, <laughs> until it's changed. Um, so uh, if you're bound by that approach until the ruling is overturned, then what? Well, it's very hard to see, I think, European states um, refusing to implement an arrest warrant issued by the court. But okay. the question of personal immunities, I think, could still be uh, agitated at the national level. Mm -hmm. And that's where you might have potentially a problem if uh, a superior national court doesn't accept the ICC appeals chamber argument that there is no longer any immunity of any form um, even for heads of state or heads of government when they're charged with an international crime. And I don't think that's um, guaranteed. But I guess my final point on this would, would be when it comes to figures like President Putin or Prime Minister Netanyahu, I, I think the point is moot, right? I mean, their, their travel options might be restricted, but it's very hard to see them being um, surrendered to the court while they're still in power. Mm. And the only time personal immunities are an issue are when you're in power, right? You know, they yeah, don't yeah. they don't go with you once you leave office. Um, and so, you know, I I don't see immunities coming into play in a practical sense. Um, the only way, uh, particularly Prime Minister Netanyahu might wind up before the court is if he had already, if he was already no longer Prime Minister. Right. Uh, and in that case, he's got significant problems closer to home in that, you know, he's got this sort of multi-phase, very complex, 300-witness mm -hmm. um, corruption trial that's running against him in uh, Israeli courts. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask then, even if we do see um, a, like an absence of executive branch steps to arrest Israeli or Hamas leaders, would we potentially see developments similar to that taken by South Africa's Supreme Court, where the judiciary rules that the state... It was a very interesting decision by, by that court to say that the state itself is breaching its rule, its obligations under the Rome Statute by failing to arrest and detain them. And generally, I wanted to ask how effective are states at arresting international criminal suspects on their territory? Right. Yes. Well, as you say, the South African example in 2015 was very interesting. So you had, um, as I recall the facts, uh, um, President Bashir attending um, uh, a African heads of state and government meeting in South Africa. He'd been invited by the um, executive arm of government and the judiciary said, no, no, there's an arrest warrant out. Um, you must uh, arrest him. And while, you know, I think while the case was being heard, Bashir's plane took off from a South African military airfield. Oh. Uh, to which the the executive branch's response was rather unconvincing. Oh, no, the message didn't get through to ground his plane in oh, okay. time. We're okay. terribly sorry. And I find it I find it quite 
I find it, it strains credulity a bit that you've got you know, people from the Attorney General's department on their feet in the Supreme Court arguing about this and somehow you haven't told uh, the people running military airstrips that he's not allowed to leave. Um, so there it can be that element of tension. In the second question you asked, sort of how effective are states generally at arresting international criminals? And certainly there's been... A number of cases uh, where I'm sitting here in the last 12 months in Australia uh, where it's been suggested that we haven't been particularly effective. So um, human rights organisations here, uh, I think late last year, uh, went public saying they had um, submitted what they thought was sort of a, a dossier that raised serious concerns of the involvement of a Sri Lankan general in war crimes and that this was a person who frequently uh, entered and exited Australia. Uh, where there's a significant Sri Lankan diaspora, and that the Australian Federal Police had done uh, first nothing effective with that file, uh, and then later, uh, after apparently sort of sitting on it or losing it for a protracted period, um, said it didn't contain enough actionable evidence that there was anything they could do. Uh, yeah. And re very recently there have been uh, reports in Australia of potentially uh, a suspect a suspect in the Rwandan genocide, having lived uh, undisturbed for some time in Australia. So on the one hand, um, even fairly well-resourced, uh, you know, liberal states with um, a strong tradition of the rule of law are sometimes not particularly effective at um, following up these things. And I mean, we know, for example, that war crimes investigations are technical and complex and resource intensive uh, and Australia's own history back in the 90s of trying to stand up a specialist war crimes investigation unit to deal with historic cases coming out of the Second World War was that those cases were incredibly hard to prove. Uh, they were embarrassing when they failed. Um, and to some extent, I guess, there's uh, a, potentially um, a view among um, Australian police forces of, well, you know, we already have a lot to do why should we dedicate an enormous amount of resource to dealing with a very small volume of potential international suspects uh, where gathering evidence sufficient to convince a judge is going to be very difficult. Yeah. Um, but putting all of that to one side, I think uh, if you act, the, the problem there is getting an arrest warrant from a national legal system, right? Or getting an arrest to stick before a judge if you've made one without a warrant. I think it's quite a different thing if you receive an arrest warrant from the International Criminal Court, then really the process under the Rome Statute is meant to be basically you check that you've got the right person, you meet a kind of number of minimum um, due process guarantees, and you then should uh, just put them on a plane. Um, whether that happens in practice, I think, remains to be seen. Mm. Yeah. And in terms of um, just finally, do you see the current Pal Israel-Palestine conflict and the public's continuing interest in it as the way of galvanizing support for international institutions, including the ICC? Right. So, I, I mean, I think this conflict in particular is a very double-edged sword for the ICC and international institutions. So um, I've been critical for different reasons of pretty much everyone who's held the job of prosecutor at the International Criminal Court. Um, but I think one would have to acknowledge that it's probably one of the hardest jobs in international law. Right? You, you know, you can't, there is no way that you are not going to disappoint or anger yeah. someone. Yeah. So, you know, any, uh, and we actually see to some extent this sort of um, pattern with other international criminal tribunals. So, you know, the um, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, its cases would be positively reported by the various national communities when they were about uh, the guys they saw as the aggressors and the cases where they were cast as the victims. Mm -hmm. But when the defendant was one of their own, the reaction was always very negative. Yeah. Um, and even and as as you said before, um, you know, it's easy to kind of say, well, the prosecutor hasn't done enough in this particular area or he's focusing on the wrong defendants. And um, ultimately, uh, 
it's to some extent a lose-lose um, job because mm -hmm. uh, we tend to see or communities tend to see international criminal justice as having this distributive function, right? We want international criminal tribunals to allocate blame to and criminality to the bad guys and yeah. exonerate the good guys. And of course, you know, we often don't have shared views as to who those parties are. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, that said, um, it's given kind of the, you know, there's been this long running sense really since the court was founded that dealing with the situation in Palestine was always going to be the hard test case for the court. So it certainly um, cannot afford to do nothing. Um, and I think on a number of controversial cases, previous prosecutors essentially parked them. Right? Um, you know, uh, Prosecutor Ben Suda uh, was given a lot of credit for opening late in her term yeah. uh, investigations into some of the more complex situations. But uh, I'm I'm not sure how much credit one deserves for opening cases that you're never going to have to see through, that you're essentially just passing uh, right. to yeah. the next prosecutor. Uh, so, yes, um, it could be a galvanising moment of support, but I think we're already seeing uh, a lot of commentary, particularly from the Global South, saying, well, everything that's happening here exposes international law as the rule of the strong, and um, you know it has no independent value. Uh, obviously, you know I've sort of dedicated my professional life to <laughs> international law, and I'd like to think it had uh, more reality and traction than that, even if it was um, imperfect. I think it was Philippe Sands who said in the ICJ in. Uh, one of the Palestine proceedings that, you know, none of us is starry eyed about international law and what it can do, but it is the tool we've got. I just wanted to say on that point that it, it is interesting to see as well what war crimes tribunals can do to a domestic public in terms of it almost has a rallying around the flag effect. So when Milosevic was tried, he campaigned from uh, prison or, or where, from, you know, the docket and he... Right such overwhelming support and I think it could perhaps have I don't know whether Netanyahu is too hated in the cases against him are too strong to have that kind of effect on the Israeli public but it is it is perhaps a bit of a a bit of a worrying one also the um given everything that's happened and to come at it from the perspective of the global south when I say no, I thought Bashir and Putin had immunity. I also think that Netanyahu has immunity currently because they're not a party to the Rome Statute. Everyone's like, how could you think? How could you think? So he could just right. get away with what he's doing. And, and I'm like, you cannot have that critique from South Asia, which has largely rejected, you know, um, ratifying the Rome Statute and which has largely been quite against, quite against the ICC. Right, right. And... Uh, and I mean, that's it's it's one of the things that we often have to do, isn't it, is to remind people of the, the reciprocal logic of international yeah. law. Well, you know, if immunity doesn't exist for these people uh, who you don't like, it won't exist for any of the people you do like either. Exactly. Um, and yeah. I think, uh, you know, there's I think there's definitely some um, unease in US circles at trying to uh, square the the circle of having said, well, we welcome the arrest warrants against uh, Vladimir Putin, um, but we think that the ICC would lack jurisdiction over Israeli officials. Well, you can't have both. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, if you've accepted, and I mean, the, the US's language was um, deliberately cautious. Right. They, I, I think President Biden said something along the lines of, you know, uh, it was the right thing that um, uh, Putin was facing these charges. So it wasn't yeah. a, a ringing endorsement of ICC jurisdiction. Um, but nonetheless, it is difficult to square that kind of statement uh, with a sort of full throated declaration that there can never be jurisdiction 
over um, nationals of non-parties to the statute. Yeah, and I think what is most interesting now about this conflict is the reactions of the global south. Um, and in terms of, you know, we've often been chastised as being rule breakers of international law and to now us being able to, to chastise the West is something probably that we're enjoying a bit too much, um, but it comes after decades of condescension. So I think it's okay for us right. to do that, yeah. Yeah, well, I, but I do think we're seeing that um, across the board, that small states and the global South are making more use of uh, international institutions. And in one of the other areas um, I follow, climate change, you know, it's been small island states that have really pushed the issue before the International Court of Justice and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Um, so again, you know, at and this would be sort of my my response to, or my partial response to those who say, well, this is the moment we've seen the mask come off and international law is merely power and so on and so forth, is that, well, no, you know, the, the language of the law and the institutions of the law allow the smaller and the less powerful to articulate claims and frame wrongs that are happening to them in terms of rules that bind everyone. Yeah. And, you know, that's been the plea of small states in the climate change proceedings has been, you know, we don't expect these, these cases to solve climate change. What we want is for the ongoing negotiations to be conducted within the framework of the law. And we want to know what that law is. And I still think that's, you know, a powerful and persuasive thing that international law can offer us. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. Um, on that note, thank you so much for joining us today and for giving us your time and your great insights. Uh, I will link to your YouTube lectures, which are absolutely fantastic on international criminal law and have helped me so much in teaching international criminal law in the description of the video. Thank you everyone for watching at home and we hope you'll tune in for future episodes.